All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. Websites to look at, antiwar.com slash radio, chaosradioaustin.org, lrn.fm, anomalyradio.com, and tomdispatch.com, where our friend Tom Engelhart keeps uh, a lot of great written material from all over the place about a lot of great things. We run almost all of it at antiwar.com under Tom Engelhart's name, and his method is to write sort of a little introductory mini-essay, uh, well, to introduce the rest of the piece written by whoever it is. So if you look at Tom Engelhart's archive at antiwar.com, you'll see many, many articles by many, many different authors. And uh, one of those who's appeared uh, quite a few times at Tom Dispatch and in his archive at antiwar.com is Dilip Hero, and he's joining us on the phone right now from England, I believe it is. Welcome to the show, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, says here at Tom Dispatch, you're the author of 32 books. The latest is After Empire, The Birth of a Multipolar World. And, uh, of course, I know that you're also the author of War Without End, The Rise of Islamist Terrorism, and The Global Response, which got a great little review on my Facebook page by uh, a friend who'd read it. This morning, when I announced that you're going to be on the show, uh, so uh, that's very impressive. 32 books. I didn't realize uh, that, but anyway. So let's focus on uh, your most recent article here for uh, TomDispatch.com, and and I guess your latest book here, After Empire: The Birth of the Multipolar World, the the kind of macro view of the the future of the balance of power of the nation states after George Bush and Dick Cheney have successfully smashed the American empire to bits in the rocks of Iraq this or drown it in the sands of Iraq I don't know <laughs> and that's, you know that that's the last book you mentioned of course it's all about empires and you must remember that my name Dilip D I L I P is an Indian name and hero H I R O which uh, Sounds Japanese, but actually in my language, H I R O hero means diamond. So you can call me Dilip Diamond. Anyway, the thing is, you know, the whole idea about empire, I mean, in a way, I'm a part of the empire because I was born before India became independent. So I was a, you know, a born in the British Empire. And as we all know, that the Britain was the number one power. Uh, before World War II, you know, it was a power like this for 100 years. And, uh, of course, uh, since the World War II, America has been a superpower, but all empires come to an end. And most of them, are, I should say, all of them end by shooting themselves in the foot. That is, they overextend themselves and are not able to sustain the domain which they are controlling. And in the case of the United States, one can see very clearly that the, shall I say, shall I say the credit for extending American empire goes to the gentleman from Crawford, known as George W. Bush, because of starting out two wars, one against Afghanistan, and secondly, against uh, Iraq in, in Afghanistan, one could say he had a reason or excuse or whatever to do something. In Iraq, he had absolutely no reason, no rational, no hard intelligence information that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, but he had this kind of an itch, and his surrounding uh, aides like Cheney and Rumsfeld had the same itch to get this fellow Saddam Hussein. Now, because of doing these two wars, and on top of that, that's another thing where, shall I say, George W. Bush tried to defy gravity. There are laws of gravity which you cannot de uh, defy, and if you defy, <laughs> you fall down. So that was, if you are fighting a war, and war is a very wasteful activity, and of course I see you know, your radio station is called anti-war. It's a very nice, very sensible thing 
to say and to be in the war because war is a totally wasteful activity which takes so much of the resources of a society and does not produce anything. It destroys, destroys, you know, kills people, destroys property, and so on. And normally when a war is uh, fought by a country, the government of that country raises taxes to finance war. What did George W. Bush do? He reduced taxes and started two wars, and then you know what happened. Exactly two years ago, uh, I should say two years and eight days ago, Lehman Brothers went down the tube. They went down, and with that, the whole credit system worldwide froze up. That means, you know, this was an example where the extension of empire not only did something wrong or something uh, disastrous politically, but also economically, because that fall of Lehman Brothers, which was, shall I say, the tipping point, actually illustrated the complete inefficiency and, uh, shall I say, the in, uh, infeasibility of uh, Reagan-style capitalism. It was Reagan in 1981 who started deregulation and free-for-all uh, supply-side capitalism. It started in 81, and it ended with George W. Bush because he took this deregulation to the extent that even when there was law, there were regulatory laws about the Wall Street, about banking and so on, and, uh, and the stock market, uh, those were not applied. So you see, I'm just illustrating the point that all empires come to an end, and of course they do not just overnight fall down. See, there's a very interesting line in the article that you mentioned, published by Tom Dispatch, where I make a comparison of this power structure with the price of a share of a company. When a company is going down, its share doesn't fall off the cliff in one free fall. No. It goes down a little bit, and at that lower price, it attracts some buyers, and then it goes up a little bit, and then it falls much further and does not rise up to the old level, and that's the way it goes down. And it is exactly the same thing that happens with empires. The empire builders uh, do not, shall I say, it's not a coup d'etat. Overnight you are out of power. Overnight you are no longer an imperialist power. It happens in stages. But you have to look at the trend of that. If you take Britain, now just to, again to go back to the financial side, the British sterling pound, as it is called, was the currency, worldwide currency, like the U.S. dollar is today. And if it was in that position all the way until uh, 1931. It was tied to the gold standard, and at that point things became so rough that it was taken off gold standard. But even then, pound was a strong currency and going on, and only it was 1967 when the British economy came to the point where the government of the day had to go to the International Monetary Fund and say, please, please, help us, help us. We don't have enough foreign exchange. Give us, some, uh, give us a loan and so on. So I'm just illustrating how a British pound, which was the universal currency for more than 100 years, came down not in one sweep, in the stages. You can find the same thing now in the case of U.S. dollar, of course, you can see in my article that you mentioned, I also discussed the relationship between U.S. dollar and the Chinese yuan. So I think I'm just giving you this uh, fundamental thesis, which is in my book, where I show the American power is declining. It doesn't mean it will decline overnight. You have to look at the train, look at the train of a share of a particular company. All right, now, Dylan, I'll ask you to hold it right there. Uh, the music's playing. we got to go out and take this break. Everybody, it's Dylan Hero. He's got a new piece at TomDispatch.com. America's suffering a power outage. And when we get back, I want to ask you kind of a one more broad historical type question and then uh, on to the specifics of your article, Where America Is Now. Right after this, y'all. You can put the Liberty Radio Network on the air in your area. 